Welcome everyone uh, to the seminar today. Uh, my name is Ben Bainey. I'm a uh, fellow at CGSR. I uh, want to introduce my friend uh, Jesse Goldhammer here to the lab today. He's going to give us uh, a talk about cybersecurity metaphors. Uh, Jesse is new Associate Dean of Business Development and Strategic Planning at the UC Berkeley Information School. Uh, Jesse formerly came from the private sector uh, where he worked with uh, government and private sector sponsors. Um, so the talk is going to be very much drawing from his experiences in the last 10 or 15 years uh, thinking about cybersecurity um, for both of those communities. So uh, thank you all for coming and listening. And with that, I'll pass it over to Jesse. Great. Thank, you. thank you for inviting me here this morning. Thank you to Ben and CGSR for the opportunity to come to you and talk about uh, cybersecurity metaphors how they shape national security policy, technical research, and the future of national security. I tend to run a fairly informal um, presentation mode. So if there are questions as I'm talking, I would just encourage you to raise your hand or jump in, and we can have a conversation. Um, I'll try not to say things that are too inflammatory. Uh, I usually know by the number of hands that go up very quickly. But I'm also going to try to be intentionally provocative because I think this is a topic that is important and requires us to think differently about how we approach the domain of cybersecurity. Um, just to give you a sense of kind of how I approach this topic, let me just say a few words about me so you have some context for how I come to this. Uh, and that may be uh, quite familiar to folks in CGSR, maybe a little bit different for folks in other parts of the lab. So a long time ago, I was a political theorist at, at UC Berkeley and an academic. Uh, and then I transitioned and I worked in the private sector at a small company you may have heard of called Yahoo. Um, from Yahoo, I got a little bit bored um, and uh, ended up going into uh, consulting where I did really strategy consulting for federal agencies for about a decade, working on topics that uh, various different types of topics that you'd all be familiar with, including one in particular where I would describe it as working on kind of the human side of cybersecurity which is what people who don't have technical training say when they say that they're working on cybersecurity in one form or another. And then um, finally, I made a, a, a most recent transition. I'm now, as uh, Ben said, Associate Dean at uh, University of California Berkeley's School of Information, which is a professional school that teaches data science. We have a master's and PhD program. And part of what I'm doing there is creating the Center for Long-Term Cybersecurity, which is a Hewlett Foundation funded center. We got about $15 million, very generous grant from the Hewlett Foundation to shape the discipline of cybersecurity. And so part of these reflections come out of the experience of working with Hewlett and also work that I've done in the past to try to bring some de definition and some discipline to something that is, um, as I will argue, is a bit all over the map. And I'm also going to kind of try to juggle a uh, computer and paper at the same time. So if there are some pauses, forgive me. Um, so let's just start with something that I imagine folks in this room are quite familiar with. This is the Comprehensive National Cybersecurity Initiative. It began under Bush II, continues under Obama. And I, I put this up here just as a way, really, of trying to illustrate the fact that kind of metaphors are sort of with us. They're important. Um, and it's really not hard to find them, even in important, you know, in this case, guiding documents, legal documents around how our country approaches cybersecurity. So if you, uh, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but if you look kind of in the middle, this is really about developing a counterintelligence plan to detect, deter, and mitigate foreign-sponsored cyber intelligence threats to the US uh, government and to the private sector. Now, um, you know, deterrence is a word that I, many of you, of course, are familiar with. It's kind of a shocking term for me in the middle of a document about cybersecurity, right? And what it does is it invokes um, an entire generation of thinking about nuclear weapons, about missile defense. It goes back to this guy here. Um, you may be familiar with him, Thomas Schelling, an economist who wrote a very famous book in the 1960s called The Strategy of Conflict, in which he starts to think through um, what deterrence means in a bipolar world. Now, um, this metaphor, and I'm going to treat deterrence as a metaphor in this case, um, had also a complementary metaphor during the middle part of the 20th century, one that you will also be familiar with. It's this one. 
And that's a pretty big deal, right? I mean, so we spent the better part of 50 years trying to figure out how to prevent this from happening, either accidentally or intentionally. We also use it as a way of describing uh, the word, right, cyber Armageddon, I think kind of invokes this image. Um, and um, it ends up being a kind of defining feature of the 20th century that we're now appropriating and using in the 21st century to describe a very different type of conflict. And part of the argument that I'm going to make today, I'm very explicit about my arguments, as you can see. And this is going to be kind of a central claim that I want to make um, over the course of the next about 30 minutes or so, is that um, first, the, first of all, the claim is going to not be that we should take something like deterrence and we should just simply apply it to cybersecurity, though I think a lot of folks are inclined to do that. And there may be some value to doing that, but I want to problematize that in the, in the course of this conversation. What I want to argue is actually there are quite a number of different types of metaphors that we're using to talk about cybersecurity. I'm going to share a few of those with you, and I'm going to argue that they're all problematic in one form or another. And then just to, again, anticipate the conclusion, the conclusion here, I'm going to leave you, I promise, dissatisfied, because I'm not going to solve this problem for you today. Instead, what I'm going to do is raise it as a set of issues and try to bring some clarity to why I think we need to work really hard at developing a better frame for understanding the, this kind of moment of conflict in which we find ourselves. And in particular, I'm going to make the argument that the metaphors that we have are either kind of too narrow or too simple or maybe even focused too narrowly on human actors to be appropriate for characterizing this, this particular moment of kind of um, uh, cyber, cyber conflict, cyber security, and the relationship between humans and machines, which I'll come back to in a moment. So act one here. Since we're talking about metaphors, I felt like I could break up my uh, presentation as a series of acts. Um, not, I'm not going to do any theatrical things up front, but it's a series of acts. <laughs> so I want to make the argument, let's, let's start with just metaphors matter, all right? I don't, wanna, I don't want us to sort of like sit back, relax, and say, well, you know, great that you want to talk about metaphors, but you know, what do metaphors have to do with conflict? And you know, why should we even think about them? Um, and I'm going to make the argument that they really shape what we think, what we do, and also what we don't do. So let me just start with a basic definition of metaphors. A metaphor is a thing regarded as representative or symbolic of something else, especially something abstract. So I'm taking some license with the notion of metaphor here, and I'm including uh, as part of a thing also concepts like deterrence. And you can call me out on that later, and that's fine, and I'll admit that I stretch things a little bit perhaps too far. Um, but I think it's valuable to treat these as metaphors and not just as kind of guiding concepts. Um, now, because I'm political, a recovering political theorist and recovering academic, um, I have a habit of wanting to really explore kind of the origin of the metaphors that we use and the, the origins of the language that we use because it, I find it helpful really for understanding both what we've lost and also what we've gained over a period of time when we use terms like cyber, for example. So let me, if you'll uh, indulge me, just spend uh, maybe a minute um, taking you backwards in time so that we can understand, again, what we've kind of gained and what we've lost in the domain of cyber. So this is uh, an image of a ship tossed at sea. Um, and I just want to read you the quote here, then I'll tell you who it's from, or maybe someone in the audience already knows. Uh, the true pilot must pay attention to the year and seasons and sky and stars and wind and whatever else belongs to his art if he intends to be really qualified for the command of a ship. Anyone want to take a guess? Close, but much, 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 much earlier. So this is Plato, book six of the Republic. <laughs> And what he's talking about, because he actually used the word, is cybernetics. And in this case, cybernetics is, a, is about um, a technical ability. It is the philosopher up in the crow's nest helping to navigate a piece of technology. So this is a big piece of technology out at sea and providing um, a certain kind of technical expertise that all of the folks who are on deck call them the demos, call them everyone the rabble, if you're from Plato's perspective, helping them kind of navigate through a very, very uncharted, difficult um, territory. So, so Plato um, 
is the origin of this word that we now use kind of ubiquitously to describe all different kinds of things, this notion of cybernetics. Now, cyber has a rich history even after Plato, and I just want to kind of offer a few different examples of how this term changes over time, just to give you a sense, again, of what we've gained and what we've lost and why that matters. Um, so uh, I've already referenced, and I'm not going to pronounce the Greek. I don't speak uh, ancient Greek in particular, but for those who might be interested in languages, I've provided the word cybernetics in ancient Greek, which really means good at, ski uh, good at steering or being a good pilot. So again, it's a technical skill. Then if you fast forward to the 19th century, you've got folks like um, Andre Marie Ampère, who's a, um, he is a mathematician, I believe. Uh, he's also uh, the origin of the word amp that we use to talk about electrical current. And he, coming out of this French tradition, now shifts the language a little bit and talks about cybernetique as being the art of governing people. So we've taken it from this kind of technical skill and now it's become a political skill in the middle of the 19th century. Fast forward again, about another 110 years or so, and we have, and I'm sure most folks in the room will be familiar with uh, Norbert Wiener, who is a mathematician and a philosopher who writes a book actually about cybernetics in the middle of the 20th century, and he describes it as the scientific study of control and communication in the animal and the machine. So, 100 years later, and we're now type, talking about cybernetic is really about control systems and feedback um, and regulation. It's automated. So just take that span, because I'm going to come back to this. You start with cybernetic as being something that humans do in control of a piece of technology. And by the time you get to the middle of the 20th century, cybernetic is what machines do with each other. And the human has hit, actually been disintermediated. And I think that this is actually incredibly important for thinking about um, the, the state we are in of cybersecurity. So just now to reinforce the point, I have on the right-hand side here just a, a drawing of a governor. Uh, a governor is a device that, as I'm sure all the engineers in the room know, governor is a device that helps to automate, uh, in this case it's for a steam engine, under different loads. And the idea is that humans should be disintermediated from this mechanical process. There's actually a device that allows it, that, that should permit us to do these kinds of things without humans having to be involved. And so the question I'm going to raise here is over the course of history, when we think about cyber and cybernetics, have we lost something important? This is the challenge I think that we face when we look at the metaphors, which I'll share with you in a moment that we use to talk about cybersecurity, whether we've lost something in this relationship between humans and machines. Second act. So this moment in thinking about now metaphors of cybersecurity and their impact, let's say technical impact or impact on research or on policy, why does this particular moment matter? Why now? One reason I think it matters now is because we actually live not a very technical term, but it's nonetheless descriptive in kind of confusing times. We actually were just talking about this uh, earlier this morning. The pace, so if you think about sort of different types of human activities, I've kind of arbitrarily selected a few here. Let's call it technology, criminal activity, politics, law, and culture. They move at different paces. And we now live in a world in which technology moves far faster than just about everything else. And if we wanted to actually have a meaningful and reasonable conversation about things like nanotechnology or genomics or high-performance computing, there are not that many people on the planet who could actually have that conversation in a way in which everyone understands what everyone else is talking about. That's a problem. So you have technology moving faster than crime, but crime, honestly, is a close second. And I had a conversation with a colleague who works in the US government who focuses on national security issues, and honestly, his major focus is on state-to-state -state conflict. And I asked him and said, what do you think is going to be the biggest driver of cybersecurity in the next 10 years, expecting that I was going to hear something about state-to-state -state conflict? And his answer was quite simple. It's crime, cybercrime in particular. So crime is moving fast because they're able to adapt a lot more quickly than we are. Politics doesn't move as fast as crime. We're sort of playing catch up. Law doesn't even move as fast as politics. And then culture is an odd one. Culture in some ways moves very, very slowly, slowly. And we see that especially in language or in the ways in which we interact with each other, culturally speaking. 
but there are also ways in which culture moves very quickly. So if you think about technology use and adaptation in different parts of the world, the way in which, I mean, just take a simple like mobile device and look at how you know, folks in Uganda use mobile devices as an address, whereas we use mobile devices for a totally different purpose. I mean, adaptation can happen, happen very quickly. Now, there's another classical word, if you indulge me again, another classical word that we can use to describe this moment. I would call it it's a nomothetic moment. A nomothetic moment is a moment in which you lay down laws or general principles. They don't happen very often. And when they do happen, it's an incredible opportunity, but it's also kind of a risky moment because it's this moment when the old metaphors that you got kind of don't work anymore to describe this new situation that you're in. And you need a different language and a different set of metaphors to capture appropriately and accurately the challenges that you actually face. So I think we are in a nomothetic moment. One of the indicators of being in a nomothetic moment is uh, confusion around language as well. So I'm going to play just a little animation here. Just all, I did 15 you know, minutes of internet searching and came up with, I don't know, 30 different ways in which we use cyber. Now what's interesting about these different concepts of cyber is that on the one hand, I think they illustrate really fundamentally that we have no idea what we're talking about when we talk about cybersecurity. Like we're just not locked down on that concept. It means all different kinds of things. And perhaps even worse, we're actually kind of, um, we actually have very different, in some cases, contradictory meanings when we're talking about the different flavors of cyber, which makes it incredibly hard to have a reasonable conversation because um, we're all coming from different vantage points and different points of view. So we use confusing language, and I'll let it just finish up. I think this is the last one, cyber vandalism. You thought, I saw, I threw cyberpunk in there. I hope someone noticed that. Um, but these, so that our, t our moment is unique, but that doesn't mean it's historically unique. It doesn't mean that we haven't been in these kinds of moments before. So let me just share three very quick examples. On the far left, we had this thing called the American Revolution, right, where we made the transition from a mon monarchy to a republic. And we, in we used language, and it wasn't necessarily new language, but the concept of federalism, for example, is a new frame for thinking about how we were going to conduct politics in a way that was different than folks who came before us. Or take the middle picture here, the Industrial Revolution, in which, again, a transition from a craft-based economy to a capitalist economy, and you have folks running around, like Karl Marx talking about class conflict, a new set of concepts that enable us to describe a new way in which we interact with each other. Or finally, our friends Khrushchev and Fidel Castro here on the far right talking about um, the Cold War. And a set of concepts, all kind of orchestrated and oriented around the notion of deterrence, helping us to make sense of this moment in which we now have a bipolar world with two superpowers armed to the teeth with nuclear weapons, which was not something that happened previously in human history. And my, the, I, these, are, these are all, each of these in different ways are transitional moments, or they're foundational moments, or they're inflective moments, inflection moments. That's where we are now. Um, and so as we wrestle with the language, uh, to wrestle with language to try to figure out what that means, we can kind of go back to these moments to see that um, this is not new in human history, but it is nonetheless important. Um, part of the reason why it's important, and I'll sort of end this chapter, this act, on this, on this point, is that first of all, especially in countries like ours, which are you know, democracies, uh, they're quite susceptible to strong public passions. And they're also driven by, in many cases, exogenous factors or shocks. So to provide a totally obvious example, 9-11 is a pretty interesting moment in human history, or in American history, where um, as a result of something that happens, we very rapidly change the pace of these different forms of human activity. And politics and law has to catch up with everything else. And we end up with a set of agencies. DHS, ODNI, that are now doing things that previously we had no agencies to, to perform those functions. We end up um, deciding what's political and what's criminal. And those, those choices, whether they're implicit or explicit, end up shaping how we live our lives and what we decide to do or not to do for many, many years thereafter. So these are profound moments where there is a sense of urgency to be using the right terms and the right concepts and be thinking about the implications here. Because if not, you can get stuck for 50 years, potentially with the wrong set of concepts and the wrong set 
of agencies trying to accomplish something that isn't quite right. Now, especially for a crowd like this, I don't really have to illustrate in any detail the data points that explain kind of how bad it is out there from a cybersecurity perspective, so I won't. But what I will do is use some of the data that you are familiar with just as a way of underscoring both the confusion and the challenge that we face as a transition to talking about some metaphors themselves. So I'll be quick about this first. This is a report from Verizon in uh, 2014. There's a ton of activity taking place in let's call it the cyber ecosystem. Um, Verizon wants to break it down to a bunch of different components. I'll break it down into two. There's a ton of crime and there's a ton of espionage. And we have trouble, I think, sometimes distinguishing between, between the two. But there's a ton of activity going on and we have a ton of data, um, you know, at least 10 years, maybe more of data about this kind of activity. Um, and that explains why we uh, are under constant attack. Just again, a few data points since 2006, 87 million federal records exposed. In 2013, 822 million private sector records exposed. Last year, US CERT responded to a little over 200 and what was it, 28,000 different incidents from federal agencies as well as from the private sector. There is a ton of activity that's going on. But here's the problem. Despite all this activity, despite all this data, we actually have incredible trouble making basic distinctions. Um, let me actually start by explaining why I put the deputy sheriff badge in the middle of the slide. The reason is I want to um, hearken back to the, the notion of, you know, sort of the old west, the idea that, you know, the sheriff could come and deputize a few folks and have them just immediately now serve the purposes of the state. Or if we go back a couple hundred years, I'll use a different word, talk about privateers where when states were fighting um, piracy, they would actually uh, deputize um, private seamen to actually perform the role of the state. We see a ton of this now in cybersecurity, which is you know, not only in our country, but in other countries where it's actually hard to distinguish who's playing in an official capacity as a state actor and who is playing in some other capacity. And when are they doing one versus the other? This is part of what makes it so complicated. So for example, we have trouble making distinctions between, you know, if you take, take Target, Sony, and Anthem, take those three hacks, just think about those hacks and think about how easy is it to make a distinction between what's national and what's global, and what's criminal and what's political. And things that start criminal become political, and things that may appear to be national actually have a global flavor to them. It's very hard to make those distinctions. Um, if you think about the market for buying zero-day exploits, it illustrates why it's very hard in some cases to distinguish between white hat and black hat. You kind of don't know what the motivations are, especially when you're buying these kinds of technical capabilities on the market. Um, on the far right, uh, public and private also become very difficult to distinguish. You can use uh, the United States as an example where we have state actors who are involved in protecting the homeland, if you will. There's offense and defense from a cybersecurity perspective. And then there is a whole constellation of private contractors who are helping those, those official actors do all different kinds of things. So where does public end and private begin? Offense and defense becomes incredibly difficult if you think about, um, especially from your perspective, uh, given the, 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 the way in which the lab is situated within the larger federal government. Um, We've got different folks who have different authorities and responsibilities, but in order to do their job, they need, there's a certain kind of ambiguity. When does offense begin? When does defense begin? And do these folks have to work together, sometimes even in the same building, to be able to do their job well? And then, of course, perpetrator and victim becomes also incredibly difficult when you think about attribution. Who's actually uh, responsible for something that happens in cyberspace, like an anthem attack? If, um, I hear from folks that maybe it's getting easier to solve the attribution problem, but even if it's easier for, let's say, the US government to solve that problem, that doesn't mean that the public perception of attribution has gotten any clearer. And we certainly saw that around the Sony attack. So it's a little bit hard out there to make basic distinctions. We don't really have any clarity about who is doing what. Um, that doesn't mean that we don't see patterns. 
Uh, so for example, within all this data, uh, Verizon says 2013 might be remembered as the year of the retailer breach, and then they provide a little bit more detail, and they say, well, actually, maybe what's really happening is it's a transition from geopolitical attacks to attacks on payment systems. That is certainly one of the reasons why uh, the cost, the estimated cost of cyber crime in particular is so high. So these numbers are outrageous, right? I mean, somewhere around $500 billion annually is what is lost to cyber crime. That is a really big number. But here's the reality of the situation. We actually have no idea how much it costs. We have no idea how to measure it. And we don't even have any idea how to measure the risk associated with cyber crime. So, to some extent, we're throwing out very large numbers, and we're also, in some, we're also flying blind. We don't have any systematic, meaningful, um, verifiable way to actually generate these numbers. That does not mean that states are not taking this stuff very seriously. So here's cyber crime as a percentage of GDP just for a handful of states in 2013. You know, these numbers may not look that big, but look, you know, when you start to approach 1% of GDP for a large industrialized country, you're talking about a significant amount of money, and all of a sudden something that might look criminal actually becomes a problem of national security, which means it gets framed in a very, very different way. So it's a pretty big deal. And because it's a big deal, states are spending a lot of money dealing with this stuff. You guys can read the numbers here. You probably know them better than I do. Um, federal government, actually beyond just even these numbers in the United States, is spending, I'm roughly guessing, somewhere between five and $10 billion across the entire federal government about cybersecurity. That's a large amount of money. What's interesting is that they're spending it really in three different domains, uh, primarily in military operations, intelligence, and law enforcement. Now the government, by virtue of law and also authorities, um, I really shouldn't put authorities in quotes, they're real, authorities. Uh, by virtue of law and authorities, they make distinctions between these different domains. And so let me just offer one kind of final thought about this, um, which is that on the corporate side, so they're also spending a ton of money in IT security, but the distinction between what's military and what's law enforcement and what's even like private self-defense is starting to get blurred in a very important way. So, you know, imagine you're a U.S. company right now, and this is happening as we speak. You might actually go to the market because you need to hire someone who does cyber intelligence. Now, 10 years ago, cyber intelligence was something that the U.S. government did. It is not something that private sector hired for. But now, there are companies that specialize in cyber intelligence, and, you know, the financial services companies are all, are, are all uh, hiring people actually out of government to build their own cyber intelligence capabilities. Now, let's just suppose... You had your own capability, but you still feel like you need, you know, some advice. Just, you know, some basic information to help you kind of protect your most important assets. And so maybe you go to a company like this one, IronNet Cybersecurity Inc. Sounds like all the other kinds of cybersecurity different consultancies out there, except this one happens to be run by Keith Alexander. So you could actually go hire the former head of the National Security Agency to help you with your cyber challenges. Now, of course, you can't share any classified information, but you got to imagine that a guy like this must have some insights about what's happening in the full kind of cyber ecosystem that would be a bit different than, you know, folks, let's just say, in the private sector. But maybe you feel constrained just even within the context of the United States itself. Like, there are things that you want to do to protect yourself or even understand, let's say, what tar you know, who's trying to steal your, your most fundamental information or your intellectual property. So maybe you feel like you need to go outside the United States, and instead you go to an organization like Team 8. Team 8 Ventures is an Israeli venture, which happens to be funded to some extent by US money, such as a guy like Eric Schmidt, for example, who formerly ran Google. And so maybe the laws in the United States feel a little too constrained in terms of what you can do, so you can get some Israelis to do it for you. And Team 8, by the way, is being run by the former head of Unit 8200 in Israel. So if Keith can't help you out, uh, maybe uh, Nadav can help you out. So if you're in the private sector, how do you, like, where does self-defense and intelligence and military ops and operation, you know, offense and defense, like, how do you make these distinctions? This is, to some extent, the Wild West right now. That's a pretty big deal for us. I'm going to draw sort of one um, pr uh, provocation here as a conclusion, and then we'll move on. The provocation is that 
maybe cybersecurity is on a trajectory right now to become highly militarized, state versus state, but also corporation versus state, unless we make some meaningful progress in the non-military realm. And just kind of think about a world in which corporations are developing essentially military capabilities to prevent people from stealing their stuff. That might have some pretty big implications for business in the United States. That is that um, you know, if you're trying to start a business or you're trying to maintain a business in the technology or any sector, but technology in particular in, particular in the United States, and you need to spend a truckload of money maintaining your defensive capabilities and or adhering to laws which are inevitably going to come from the federal government about what you should or should not do in the domain of cybersecurity, it becomes really hard to, become, to be competitive if you compare yourself to what's happening in, say, China or Russia or Israel or other countries in the world. So this is a big deal. This is a big deal. So with that context in mind and with that as a backdrop, let's now talk about a handful of metaphors and their implications then for how we think about and how we view or filter um, cybersecurity. I'm using the word kind of guiding meta metaphors here. I actually think the more dominant metaphors, I think these are the ones you most often see in discourse about cybersecurity. Um, I gave you this definition earlier of cybersecurity, of, excuse me, of metaphors. I want to just now define it a little bit more specifically. I had originally said it's a thing that's representative or symbolic of something uh, else, like especially something abstract. Um, I also want to say that it's not a theory. So a metaphor is really a framework that guides our reasoning, our behavior, and our policy making. And so I want to treat these frameworks, sorry, treat these metaphors as a framework. And we're going to look at the following metaphors. I'm going to look at the ones on the left, deterrence, insurance, liability, and then two that, I've, uh, that I call romantic rogues and user incompetence. Uh, I think I just want you to keep in mind that there are lots of other metaphors floating out there, including opportunity, cost, and let's say disease. I'm not going to cover those in my presentation today, but we can certainly talk about them during Q&A. Let's start with deterrence. Now, I know that I'm on risky ground here because there are a few folks in this room who know a lot more about deterrence than I do, so I'll try to tread lightly. What's interesting about the deterrence metaphor, and so deterrence comes really out of, it comes out of economics, but it really comes out of political theory. And it's asking the fundamental question, how do I make the cost to an attacker credibly positive and robust? And let me just say that again to internalize it. How do I make the costs to an attacker credibly positive and robust? And this comes out of rational deterrence theory, which really says that you should attack if the subjective utility is positive. One of the things to me that's interesting about deterrence theory is, first of all, it, it typically gets used in kind of thinking about states and in state-to-state -state relationships. And it really preferences offense versus defense for a couple of reasons. The first is that um, it, 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 um, it leads you to kind of focus on offense-dominant technology, the idea that it's, it's just a lot easier and cheaper, frankly, than it, to attack than it is to defend. It's much more costly to defend. Attackers only need to win once. Defenders have to win every single time. There's also a psychological component to deterrence, which you can easily see during the Cold War, even all the way up until uh, Reagan, which is that uh, it's cool to attack and it's much less sexy to play defense, frankly. And then finally, the costs of a failed attack are very low, but the costs of defense are incredibly high. So you can, you, know, you can almost think, for example, now what would be the implications of this for cybersecurity? From a policy perspective, you could imagine that there, we're, we may look toward years of bi- and multilateral negotiations and agreements, as well as institutions that certify them, a, a little bit like we spent a decade negotiating SALT I and SALT II accords, uh, which was really about um, understanding the number of missiles that we had pointed at each other between the United States and the Soviet Union. So this kind, of, this kind of metaphor sort of points in that direction. From a research perspective, you can imagine some very interesting things about validation and attribution. Because the only way you can come to accord in a deterrence mindset is if you can actually validate that what, your, uh, what the enemy is doing is in fact what they say they're doing. And so we spent a lot of time during the middle of the 20th century perfecting our ability to validate 
uh, number of missiles, number of warheads, capacity of warheads, things like that. We aren't even close to being, being able to do that in the domain of cybersecurity. And so one of the fundamental weaknesses of deterrence metaphor for thinking about cybersecurity is we're not technically yet at the ability where we would need to be to be able to apply it in any meaningful way, even state versus state. And maybe even more importantly, so much if crime is going to be at the center of cybersecurity for the next 10 years, that to some extent is about non-state actors. And it's unclear, even from research that I've done, that deterrence operates when uh, you're dealing with non-state actors as opposed to state actors, which have a lot more to lose. So that's deterrence theory. Let's take another one. Now we're sort of shifting away from a metaphor that's classic, classically used around conflict to one that's really about insurance, all right? This is a, 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 this is a, a narrower uh, metaphor. And uh, the fundamental question that you would ask here is, how much should I spend to protect my IP from theft or destruction? Um, and the answer, and this is the fundamental problem with this metaphor, is that you really just don't know. Today, we have no idea how much you should spend. And there's a couple of reasons for this. The first is that IP is really difficult to appraise. You know, do you do it on the basis of future revenue or market value? Uh, do you do it on the basis of input costs like R&D? Uh, market valuation is especially in M&A transactions. Typically, don't include uh, or take account of the risk that IP is going to be stolen. And um, to make that valuation even more complicated in the domain of cyber, you don't know if your stuff is stolen, when it might in fact actually be used in the world. Maybe it gets put on a shelf for 10 years, maybe it doesn't. The, cyber, the, the implications of this kind of metaphor for cybersecurity are also, I think, kind of interesting. On the one hand, you can imagine in a country like ours where you have a ton of policy innovation really on a state-by-state -state basis. So there is cyber insurance now, though I think it's very hard to understand what it is that you're getting for cyber insurance and whether it actually covers losses that are changing dramatically. So for example, there's one study that for businesses in particular, one study that I saw that suggests that every breach is now costing about almost $6 million, which is a ton of money depending upon the size of your business. Um, but it's also a relatively new field. So DHS has been looking at cyber insurance really since 2012, only in the last three years. There's a ton of work to be done in this space. I can imagine from a technical standpoint, there might be some very interesting research around actuarial science and real-time data, which is we're getting so much data about what's happening in the cyber ecosystem, whether there's some way of using that data to um, sort of update um, how we think about the value of cyber insurance from an actuarial perspective might be quite interesting. It would be very different than the way in which we typically use data for determining um, valuations and insurance. So that's cyber insurance. How about liability metaphor? Kind of similar to some extent to the insurance metaphor. Asking, however, this comes out of contract law and asking a, a little bit of a different question, which is who bears the cost of a loss? Now, let's take Target as an example. So Target, as everyone knows, got hacked. It suffers an undetermined amount of reputational cost because they clearly were quite vulnerable. Banks lose about $200 million. Uh, due to fraud, consumers lose a ton of time. But here's where it gets sticky, and here's where this metaphor falls apart. Um, well, first, so Target stock, I mean, if we're looking at sort of the cost to Target in particular, their so stock dropped about 2%, but then recovered within about two quarters, which is not terribly significant. The reason why this is a really hard metaphor to use, at least today, is that customers are not liable for fraud on their credit cards. So there's no behavioral incentive for them to actually be cautious about who they give their cards to, because the bank assumes the, uh, assumes the responsibility. The other big issue, which I'm sure you've talked about many times, is that software is sold as is. And so the writers, the people who are writing software and the people who are using software are not necessarily liable for the vulnerabilities in that software, which means that I would expect from a policy perspective we're going to see a shift of liability from businesses to customers and to the government, which is really the only place it can go. Um, and that's going to be incredibly costly if, unless we can change the dynamic of cybercrime um, as we currently see it. Um, and from a research perspective, I would imagine some very interesting stuff around digital forensics. So think about sort of auto liability right now. Like when there's a car crash, we actually have the technology. We're fairly well, fairly well understood technology to determine what happened and who's at fault. It is much harder to do that in a cyber environment, especially one that is constantly changing. And so until we really have the ability to do 
very clear and accurate uh, digital forensics, it's going to be very hard to determine who is it li who's liable for what and for how much. Next, let's talk about what I call, and I like this one, uh, let's call it the knowledge citadel metaphor, which is kind of rooted, let's say, in philosophy. And the basic notion here is who has the knowledge or expertise to lead the fight against cybercrime and espionage? And the answer today is pretty straightforward. Um, it's the US government and it's you guys, because you're the only ones really with the knowledge and the expertise and the infrastructure to be able to do the kind of research that's required to be able to understand what we need to know to fight the good fight. Um, there is, however, an important problem with this metaphor, which is that the US government, by reasons of classification, cannot share a huge amount of information with the public sector and with, and with private citizens in order to protect themselves. It just simply can't be done. So what happens is we have private sector essentially pays for, call it commercial grade security, uh, via antivirus software on their uh, laptops and their hard tops and their hard drives. And then uh, organizations like NIST come in with frameworks and best practices to you know, help businesses understand what they need to do with, to the protect themselves. Uh, evidence seems to suggest that if you have a state actor coming after you as a corporation, that this stuff is good but not great. It doesn't typically help you out. Um, I've heard stories, uh, one story from a researcher at APL. Um, you have, it was public knowledge that APL was hacked by a foreign country. Um, and what's really problematic about this is they figured out who hacked them. They figured out what they took. And there's nothing you can do. And that is also a kind of fundamental problem, which is rooted in this metaphor, which is the only people who really can act in any, um, uh, it, in a way that has any consequence, again, are state-based actors. Unless the private sector, as I think they're doing, is starting to move in the direction of trying to figure out how to act themselves. So there's this kind of unresolvable tension between what the government knows and what knowledge the private sector needs for its security. You can imagine that that moves in some pretty interesting directions when we look at policy and research implications. So from a policy perspective, you can imagine interesting policies around information sharing between the government and the private sector, as well as really interesting policy around active defense. Because I promise you, some corporation is going to do something somewhere at some time, and it's going to go horribly wrong. And Congress and the states are going to have to act to say, look, in active defense, you can do these things, but you cannot do those things. But because cyber is a global thing, then the Israelis will get the job, and the American, you know, like, you know, it'll go somewhere else. There's a big problem that we need to think through carefully. From the research perspective, I could imagine some very interesting work around information management, visual, visualization, and encryption, because if we are going to move in the direction of sharing more information from the government to the private sector, it's going to have to be done uh, in a secure way. Uh, it's going to be, have to be done in a way, in, probably in an automated way, in which corporations can use the data without having an army of people looking at the data. Um, and uh, you probably have noticed the government is not always the best at doing customer service. So it's going to have to be done in a way in which corporations can use it without dedicating tremendous amounts of resources. So um, some pretty interesting, pretty interesting directions that come out of the knowledge citadel metaphor. Uh, second to last, let's call it the romantic rogues metaphor. So this one cuts in a slightly different direction than the metaphors we've looked at uh, so far. This one really comes out of literature and is asking the question, like, who's going to win this kind of moral battle between good and evil, between white hat and black hat hackers who are um, flouting or even breaking the rules to either exploit us or protect us? So here's how this metaphor might be used. You can imagine a world in which Cybersecurity got, kind of gets played at two different levels. There's this sort of elite level where there are a small number of actors, maybe they're state actors, maybe they're non-state actors, but they're not that many of them. And they're playing one set of games, and only they're aware of the games that they're playing. And then there's everyone else. And everyone else is playing a different game. And they kind of read about this you know, more elite game, this more sophisticated game sometimes. Like sometimes there's some indicators about it, but fundamentally, there, you know, you know, there's a kind of flea market down here of different types of, you know, technologies and protective systems, but that's not really the game that we're playing. And then when you think about sort of the exploits that come out that fuel this game, and I've heard folks say this, maybe there's only a couple of hundred people in the world who actually have the technical skill 
to identify and deploy zero-day exploits in a really powerful and interesting way, whether it's for cyber war, or cyber espionage, or something else. In a world like this, it is very difficult to distinguish between the good guys and the bad guys. It's just very hard to know. And certainly, if you read the discourse around, let's say, Stuxnet, you would see a ton of this kind of metaphor being deployed. A um, guy like Kevin Mitnick might be kind of an interesting example of this, right? So he's one of the early hackers, late 80s, early 90s, decides he's going to hack into some US government systems. The FBI comes after him. He says, you'll never catch me. They say, well, we'll eventually catch you. They catch him in 1995. They stick him in solitary confinement for a year. He was a young guy. It was pretty brutal for him. I actually met him at one point. Uh, you know, possibly deserved, possibly not. And then he comes out, and now he's on the white hat side, and he works with corporations to protect them from getting hacked, right? So this is a pretty interesting world. Um, again, framed through this lens of romantic rogues. Um, this one is also, I would say this metaphor is a bit complementary with the deterrence metaphor. So both are kind of Manichaean in a sense. They both, you know, there's the good guys and the bad guys. It's a relatively simplified world. One looking through kind of a literature lens, the other one looking through a rational actor lens. And then finally, kind of honestly, one of my favorites is, let's call it the user incompetency metaphor, the user incompetence metaphor. This one comes out of cognitive psychology. So again, it's sort of a shift in lens. And the basic question here is, how can we shape human behavior to improve cybersecurity? We all know that everyone is susceptible to social engineering, right? We can all get duped. And part of the reason why we get duped is that users don't think they're at risk. And here are a couple, there are lots of examples about why we don't think we're at risk. Here are a couple of examples. One of them, let's call it, it's called the uh, Lake Wobegon effect, after a fictitious lake in Michigan. Um, how many of you, and just to illustrate this point, how many of you think you're a better than average driver? <laughs> right. The majority of you. That's exactly the problem. We all think we're a better than average driver, and we all think that we're less vulnerable than everyone else. And of course, that's not true. Uh, so we, there's a sort of psychological effect at play here. There's also what you could call the perverse impact or instability of stability effect, which is you, as, as you increase your security measures, as you make yourself more secure, you engage in riskier behaviors. And that makes you actually less secure. Uh, there's also a final one, cognitive miserliness effect. This happens when you get um, like SSL warnings on your computer screen with a ton of text explaining to you why, and I find this incredibly, like why you should not click through to the website, right? How are you supposed to know? Like on what basis are you supposed to make the decision to either click through or not click through? It'd be helpful if someone said, the last 50 people who clicked through had their hard drives wiped out. Like that would help me out. Or, <laughs> You know, something that's just a little bit more emphatic, but really what happens is we don't read very much of this stuff because we're a bit miserly in terms of how we behave, in terms of how we uh, digest large amounts of technical information. Maybe that's not true for all of you. It's certainly true for me. Um, and as a result of this, it's, it may be the case we're just not quite as rational as, for example, the rational deterrence theory would have us believe. Now, to me, what's interesting about this is this gets to the heart of um, this relationship between humans and machines. So one conclusion you could draw from this metaphor is that, um, like from a policy perspective, if you think about like the policy implications of this metaphor for cybersecurity, that where you'd see a lot of activities in public health or in safety or in education. So the goal is to change human behavior in the same way that we basically eliminated smoking in the state of California, or in the same way that you know if you have children, they're all at some point learning geometry. Like we could imagine doubling down on um, cyber education, cyber, cyber safety training as a way of finally getting us to behave in a way that uh, starts to cut against some of these irras irrational behaviors. You can imagine in the research perspective some very interesting work around behavioral science or around um, cognitive science. Um, but there I think it gets interesting because the question is, do you want to change how people behave or do you want to change how we interact with machines and what mach how machines operate for human beings. Right now, we live in a world in which the machines kind of take advantage of us because they're not actually designed for how we actually behave. And so you can imagine quite a bit of interesting research about changing the design of the computers and the machines that we use to account for these kinds of things. Because guess what? You know, if we go back to paste, paste layering, 
um, we do not evolve as fast as the technologies do. And so if we're going to depend on our behavior changes to secure ourselves, um, that might be a losing battle. Let me now just quickly conclude and we can have a quick uh, conversation. So what are the implications of this for the future of US national security? I'll be, in the same way that I was bold about sort of my claim, I'll be bold about my conclusion, which is that I'm just not sure that we have the right metaphors. So if you think about like deterrence and romantic rogues, um, it's just not clear that those metaphors frame, con it's, it's possible that those metaphors frame conflict for us in a way that is either too simple or that frankly mischaracterizes the nature of the conflict that we now face in cybersecurity. <coughs> that both state and non-state actors, it's crime as well as political activity, it's all mixed together in a way that is far more, far messier, frankly, than it was back in the middle of the 20th century. It's possible that some of these metaphors also um, just are inadequate for fully guiding or fully framing what we need to do in the domain of cybersecurity. And I would argue for the insurance metaphor, the liability metaphor. Undoubtedly, we will have robust cyber insurance. Um, undoubtedly, we will figure out liability, but that's not, I don't think, going to be the kind of fundamental frame that we're going to need to um, shift how we think about cybersecurity as a whole. I think that's just going to be a piece of the story. And then finally, there's this user incompetence metaphor, which is, again, sort of calls into question what is the relationship between humans and machines? And to some extent assumes that it's humans, it's us that needs to take the responsibility for changing so that the machines can work in a secure way. Now, that takes us back to the beginning of my presentation. Back to where we started, back to cybernetics. On the left you have, you know, at least from, the, from Plato's perspective, you have a philosopher sitting in the crow's nest. You have a human being in control of a piece of technology. And it's really about the experience, sort of the art and the science of knowing how to navigate the seas that allows a human being to control that piece of technology. And on the right, you have a piece of technology that was designed to disintermediate humans. Where you have now control systems talking to your control systems and you move in the direction of, let's say, autonomous warfare, of uh, drones that just need algorithms to be able to do what they need to do. This raises two fundamental questions. The first is, um, is cyber security, or maybe even cybernetics, is this about how we govern ourselves? Or is it about how we build self-regulating systems so we don't need to do that? And, and maybe, to me, the fundamental question is, what's actually in the middle? How do humans, how do we in this room articulate how to make the choices about when we should be in control and when the machine should be in control? Because we don't have that language yet. Like, that to me is kind of the missing metaphor, if you will. And it's rooted in this notion of cybernetics. But cybernetics doesn't actually clarify it for us. And so as we think about our current condition, this is a map of the internet at night, um, it's perhaps no surprise that the um, metaphors that we've inherited aren't quite right, are, are inadequate for helping us to make sense of this. Because this has never happened before in human history. And so the concepts and the language and the metaphors that we've inherited from great thinkers, um, great, great mathematicians, philosophers, and political thinkers are also not quite right for dealing with this. So our challenge really is to come up with the right set of metaphors for talking about cybersecurity. And we can do that right now um, as we start a conversation about these metaphors. And I'll end there. <laughs>